We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. May please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in your life. To live a life worthy of the Lord, for it is the Lord who has qualified you. You... And I were unqualified, not able, not good enough, smart enough, strong enough, holy enough. Our resume was woefully lacking to enter the kingdom of heaven. We were unqualified to do so. And yet... It is God Himself who has qualified us. For He alone, who is worthy, has given us His quality to take on as our own. And through His mercy, we are now qualified to share in that inheritance. Qualified to stand with saints and qualify to dwell in his kingdom now and forever. So live a life worthy of that. Live a life worthy of such a Lord, of such a friend, and of such a king. One who would give us his quality to be our own. The parable which we had within our gospel is one of the best known in all the Bible. It's one of those few parables that you find outside of the church and that so many people seem to be aware of that the actual parable itself is given a title. A title that appears nowhere within the story itself. But it's given a title that almost everyone everywhere has heard of. And pretty much everyone thinks they understand what it's all about. So once again, it's never actually mentioned within this story by title. Jesus never utters, this is how we ought to describe this story. And yet we all know, this is the parable of the... Good Samaritan. good Samaritan. And he's good, right? Sure he is. He's so good that we are told, hey, you know what that dude did? You do it too. So that's good. The story itself is broadly familiar to almost anyone. The idea of mercy and kindness, <coughs> the idea of sacrifice and care, even to those that we seemingly have no connection to. Those who might even be called our enemy. So within the church, we would unpack the story typically by reminding each other about the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews. That Samaria as a region was once a part of the northern kingdom of Israel. That same northern kingdom that Amos is prophesying against in our first reading. That same northern kingdom that will be judged as idolatrous, unfaithful, and wicked and will be destroyed and carried away by foreign powers. Well, that same region is never Jewish again. Others will settle there. The few Jews who remain will intermarry. A temple will be built within this area, not just to rival the temple of Jerusalem, but to try to replace it. Anything you can do, we can do better. And we'll make it bigger and more excellent. And it's where God's really going to live, not down there in Jerusalem. Hoda Cowtown. 
because Samaria is the place to be. See, we're connected to all the biggest and the baddest powers of the region. Who cares if there's a little idol worship thrown in? Who cares if there's a little intermarrying and violating what the Lord has always told the Jews as far as preserving their culture and the law? Samaria becomes a rival to Judah, in essence. And those Samaritans are viewed by the Jews as traitors. Traitors to the people, traitors to the faith, traitors to the temple, traitors to God. The Samaritans see themselves as both unfairly critiqued and also superior at the same time. <clears throat> How dare you look down on us, you dirty, filthy, little ragtag band of nobodies. <coughs> so the rivalry has now continued for generations. And it's intense and it's deep. But in essence, it's also symbolic. Jesus is not naming specific individual people. He is referring to them in sort of generic and broad terms. A priest, a Levite, a man traveling, some robbers, and that Samaritan. <coughs> so rather than specifically identify with particular people, the Samaritan is both a Samaritan, but he's also kind of symbolic. And feel free to replace him within your own head of whoever it is you don't like. Feel free to replace him in your own head for any group of people that you find suspicious, or arrogant, or wrong, feel free to substitute Samaritan for anyone and everyone you would consider to be an enemy. That as we retell the story, that those in charge of religious sacrifice and instruction value their ritual purity above the life of this dying man, and it's only one person who responds. But of course we have to back up even further to that, because the story in itself is the answer to a question. We have a smart aleck. So many of these stories begin that way, and the smart aleck is trying to trick Jesus. He wants Jesus to say something provocative, or, or say something that he can you know, prove to be wrong, or can get people turned against Jesus. And he says, Oh, teacher. It helps when I use this. <laughs> oh, teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Well, tell me what the scripture says. Pretty good starting point. To inherit eternal life, one must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yours. <laughs> Gold star. <laughs> and to be perfectly honest, it's a great answer. It is a great answer. And Jesus acknowledges that. You, God. So why are you asking me? Do that thing you said. Love God with all of you, with everything. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Everything you got. Everything you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. The way you care for yourself. Protect yourself. You do that to your neighbor as well. Then here's the follow -up. We're given an insight into the man by saying he wants to justify himself. Yes, of course, but, but, who is my neighbor? And that's where the whole thing turns. Everything that we've mentioned about the Samaritan, everything that we've mentioned about the enemy, about the suspicious person, about whatever person it is that you don't like, that you don't trust, that you are at odds with, it comes in response to the smart aleck saying, but who is my neighbor? 
And he may have been someone who treated his neighbor to the left and his neighbor to the right and the one in front and the one behind very faithfully and very well. No idea. But seeking to justify himself, apparently, he wants to know. Draw the boundaries so that I can take care of what I need to take care of and I can safely ignore the rest. And instead of giving him an answer, well, it's actually Bill, and it's Tim, but it's definitely not Sharon, Jesus tells a story. He tells the story of the good Samaritan. And even the smart aleck guy, when posed to the question at the end, which of those three people was a neighbor to the man, he knows. And he knows he's caught, and he knows he's stuck. It was the guy who loved him. It was the guy who sacrificed for him. It was the guy who cared for him, intended him, and got him back to hell. It was the guy who said, I got no responsibility for you. I didn't do this to you. I don't even like you. I don't live near you. I've never met you before in my life. But here you are. You are hurting. You are dying. And you are alone. And I don't care if no one else responds. I am here right now. And I The one who acts like a neighbor is the one who has mercy and who loves and cares for this man. Sacrificially, he loves and he cares for this man so that he might be nourished back to health. This man who has been left for dead might live. No reason, no responsibility, no connection, no obligation. He does it anyway. He has mercy on this man and he loves him as he would love himself. And the point that is typically brought out at this moment is that as the Samaritan is a neighbor to the man that he didn't know, that he didn't like, and he lived nowhere near, we too ought to be merciful and understand that our neighbor is anyone and everyone the Lord has placed within our life, either directly or indirectly right in front of us or tangentially. There is no way to draw a line to say, this is in my neighborhood and this is outside of my neighborhood. Who's my neighbor? They are. So have mercy. Love them and care for them as this Samaritan did. As your enemy did. Go and do likewise now to your enemy, for he as we talk about living a life worthy of a Lord who has qualified us. To love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbors ourselves. That's how we do it. To love God with all we've got. And to love our neighbor anywhere, everywhere, everyone. As we love ourselves. And yet one more point to the story, and it's one that is less frequently brought up. <coughs> but it connects so well with living a life worthy of a merciful God who has qualified us so that we might bear good fruit to bring Him glory. For we have all been the man on the side of the road. One thing to identify yourself as a Samaritan. Never forget you have been left for dead as well. God have mercy on you. Whether it happened when you were too young to even remember, whether it happened just a short time ago within your mature adulthood, if it's even conceivable that it hasn't happened yet, <coughs> it can and shall. For you were left for dead in your own sin. God have mercy on you. With no responsibility, He loved us first. He picks us up, broken, bleeding, and dying, and draws us in to heal us and to restore us and so that the dead might live. saved 
by one that we have treated as an enemy. And it is God himself. As God has had mercy on you, go and do what? Find your neighbor. It's actually not hard to find at all. Just open your eyes wherever you might find them. And the Lord will show a neighbor to you. That you might love and serve and care for. You might protect, heal, help to restore to life. And that in doing so, that we might love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength live a life worthy of the Lord who has qualified us of the Lord who has been merciful to us. Live a life worthy of the Lord who has brought us from death and taken us God has had mercy on you. He has had mercy on me. Go now, therefore, in thanksgiving, in gratitude, and in worship. Go, therefore, and do likewise.